Thank you for coming to the uh, latest CARE seminar, Center for Air Research seminar. Um, it's on a Saturday, but it's Alumni Day, so this is an event open to our alumni as well. We're very fortunate to have Professor Serge Villani to give uh, his view on uh, artificial intelligence and ethics today. As I'm sure all of you know, he's a uh, French mathematician and politician working primarily this I didn't know, partial differential equations, Riemannian geometry, and mathematical physics. He was awarded the Fields Medal in 2010 and the Duke Prize in 2014. And uh, he directed the Institut Henri Poincaré in Paris from 2009 to 2017. And uh, he has held various visiting positions at different universities worldwide. Cédric was uh, elected to the National Assembly, the lower house of the French parliament, during the 2017 legislative election, he was elected vice president of the French Parliament Office for the evaluation of scientific and technological choices in July 2017. I wish every country in the world has such an office. And uh, he's a member of the Academy of Sciences in France and has published several books, including A Life Theorem, <laughs> which has been translated into 12 languages. And uh, finally, and most importantly for us today, he was asked by the French minister to conduct the mission on AI for humanity presented to the French president, Emmanuel Macron, in March 2018. And as you know, human-centered uh, and beneficial AI is the mission of our Center for AI Research. So let's welcome Professor Cédric Villani. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here and uh, we have plenty of time to discuss about artificial intelligence. Oops. Mm. Okay. Uh, artificial intelligence, for sure, is not a good denomination. Already in the mid-1950s, when there was the seminar in which the notion of artificial intelligence was introduced and the name artificial intelligence was introduced, the participants were wondering whether it was the right name. And in those days, it made, however, more sense than today because they had this idea that they were going to emulate the human intelligence in the form of an algorithm to reproduce. And that made sense. Intelligence is what we are doing or other beings that we consider as intelligent. And then if we reproduce it in something that is made by man, we will call it artificial. It turned out uh, over the years that there was not one field of artificial intelligence, but many different directions. And it turned out eventually that what now we call artificial intelligence in most applications, in newspapers, etc., etc., is not intelligent at all, but is algorithmic with a view to reproduce some tasks that one could have thought were reserved for intelligent beings. Yes, you were wondering about the mic? I was wondering whether the song sold there was a little bit of echo, but I don't think it's on. I don't think it's on. Yes. So, there we are with algorithmic, and let's recall that algorithmic is strongly related to mathematics, even though very often these are issues of slightly different nature in the point of view that you adopt. For instance, a mathematical concept that is well-known, can lend itself to various algorithmic treatments, 
some of them efficient and some of them not. And sometimes it may be a huge problem to determine what is the limit in the complexity or the more efficient uh, ways to do things. But also, if you have a program which uh, is not able, for which you don't know the mathematical content underlying, then you don't really understand your program. And nowadays, the tendency to write mathematical proofs in more constructive way has been, for sure, influenced by the development of algorithmic and computer science. Some of the most important, or most striking facts for artificial intelligence now as we shall discuss, is that it has developed in an extremely pragmatic way. And for many people, it looks like applications still in search of a theory. I remember the head of a famous artificial intelligence lab in Europe telling me, we Experts at artificial intelligence are like alchemists, you know, alchemists from the ancient time with our big book full of magical formulas. When there's a new problem, we search in the book, is there the formula that should work? And we try it. And of course, that's not the usual scientific approach that we scientists have been trained into. I remember another heated discussion with a mathematician colleague at the past International Congress of Mathematicians in Rio. And a very distinguished uh, American expert in analysis. And he was telling me, Cedric, that artificial intelligence stuff, it's not science. It's just technology, there's nothing into it. Of course, it was a bit exaggerated, but these kind of comments are important to remind us that powerful as it may be today, the artificial intelligence has still kept most of its secrets uh, unraveled. And it's a kind of twist in the old days, computers, at the very start of computer science, they were being made for solving mathematical problems that we knew. In particular, differential equations, partial differential equations, were on the top of the agenda for all the main people involved. Turing, Shannon, von Neumann, they all dreamed of having computers so that they can construct solutions of mathematical objects that were well known. Nowadays, it's kind of the reverse. We have com our computers are able to compute solutions, but we don't know what is the mathematical problem that they are solving, in some sense. It's also good to recall in this dilemma, in this issue, that some well-known mathematical objects may be very mysterious from the algorithmic point of view, and vice versa. We all, uh, some of you for sure know one of the famous examples. One of the most simple algorithms of all is multiplication. We learn in school how to do multiplication, one number, another number, and etc. And if you have a number of size n here, size n here, roughly speaking, the number of operations will be of the order of n square. Okay? And graphically, there is some kind of square that it draws on your sheet of page. And uh, we've been doing this for so many hundreds of years that it sounds so natural and the only way to do. 
So it came as a surprise in the 60s when it was discovered that you can do in order n to the 1.5. And then even better, or n to the order 1 plus epsilon, however small epsilon is, can be achieved. So you can do it for very large number in uh, uh, like a power of uh, n to the 1.001 or something like this. Isn't this amazing? Sometimes the very simple is so very complicated and rich. And this example is also a good illustration of the difference between mathematics and algorithmic. Mathematics, you have the multiplication operation, and then we study multiplication, understand it, etc., all the properties. Then we go to algorithmic, it's the same multiplication, but now our focus is how complicated is it to multiply? How can we achieve it in practice? How many moves does it take? How many operations? It's about efficiency and possibility to construct. And the big thing which emerged is that for many practical purpose, such as recognizing a person's face, or uh, recognizing a handwriting, or detecting some disease, which obviously are the result of some complicated abstract operation, the solution can be obtained algorithmically in a much smaller number of steps than was expected still a few years ago. This is a surprise of science and currently a big, how to say, we say uh, in Pierre in the, dans le jardin, it's a stone in our garden of us scientists. And uh, one of these uh, narcissistic ones that uh, the field has to uh, go through uh, from time to time. At one point, uh, we were obsessed by the fact that we could not solve the continuum hypothesis. At some other point, there seemed to be some uh, horrible internal contradiction into mathematics. Now we have this. We are unable to explain the efficiency and to understand why it is the uh, complexity of operations which are reproducing tasks coming from the real world. It's a big twist. So in this lecture, I will talk about a few other big twists, and they will all come together in the end. Let me tell you now about artificial intelligence from my point of view. I first encountered artificial intelligence when I was a teenager interested in science, reading the books by Douglas Hofstadter that for sure some uh, people in the audience have also met, encountered uh, the writings, I mean. Hofstadter was uh, one of the first to report for broad audience about the famous biography uh, of uh, Alan Turing, the big biography, uh, uh, the enigma that uh, came out in the 80s. And uh, he spent entire uh, pages talking about what it was the dream of artificial intelligence, how it evolved, and so on. In those days, it was very surprising. You would read about the life of Alan Turing, and you thought, what the hell is this? I never heard of this guy, and he, uh, okay, when it was in the, in the movie, in one of the movies about Steve Jobs, he's quoted on saying he saved the world single-handedly, which of course is an uh, impossible statement, but let's say he played a very important contribution in saving the world, and also in creating some of the most important modern fields of science, of course not alone. And uh, the picture that was presented by Hofstadter was very fascinating for a young scientist, mixing questions, deep questions about what is a reasoning, 
what is the self-conscious, what is it to have a, a process that is self-referring. It was the first time I encountered the concept of uh, recursivity. There were some examples of programming in Lisp, which in those days was believed to be the gold standard for doing artificial intelligence. And um, it was a fascinating topic. However, when I went into professional mathematics in the mid-90s, artificial intelligence was definitely not considered to be a super duper subject with big applications and not one subject that our professors at Ecole Normale Supérieure would recommend us to go into. Some people would go in there, very much attracted by the dream of uh, understanding the cognitive processes and things like this. <coughs> but it was not supposed to be the big competitive subject. Very, very different from the situation today that I will talk about. I did a little bit of small artificial intelligence for, my, uh, for an essay and a project at the end of my first year. Our professor was uh, Emmanuel Bacri for a course of music and mathematics. Nowadays, Bacri is one of the most respected uh, French uh, people working on artificial intelligence for mining health data in particular. And in those days, he was giving this course on mathematics and music, which at some point was the only course that I was uh, attending, really. I mean, all other courses I was, uh, OK, partying with my friends, rather. These, were, these are days that are gone. And uh, the project that we had to do, well, my colleague and me, was a program that would, if listening to a kind of music, automatically detect what is the, the, the melody. The melody, finding the right uh, frequencies is easy, of course. What is difficult is the rhythm. If you want to write the score, how to do? Nowadays, there are beautiful software that do it automatically. They say, but in those days, it was like uh, ideas in the air. How would you do it, etc. And we made this big program in Lisp to handle it. I remember very well, uh, there are people in the room who did some Lisp. Yes. So you will understand the feeling that I will describe and I will tell you that on the day that we were supposed to give the, uh, show the algorithm to our professor, just the night before, around 3 AM, we discovered where was the missing bracket, the one missing bracket that was making the whole program break down. <laughs> OK, so after this episode, we were done with artificial intelligence, so it seems. And I went into completely different subjects of science. Partial differential equations, yes. Mathematical physics, which was a surprise for me, actually, because I was not so uh, keen on physics. And I turned out to be an expert in mathematical physics. Partial differential equations with statistical content, so quite a lot of statistics and information theory or so, related to Boltzmann equation and kinetic theory of gases. And uh, in the study of what is called now optimal transport problem, and which became very fashionable around 2000 and so, a mixture of optimization, geometry, and probability theory that occurs in various problems of uh, optimization. And in those days, so in the 2000s, uh, one of the things that happened also related to artificial intelligence that I saw is that one of my main collaborators, 
decided to go in this topic. And I remember telling him, are you sure you want to do it? It does not look like a very promising subject. It's good to recognize when you have it completely wrong, you know. <laughs> and he told me, it's a subject that in which more mathematics need to be put. And with my background in geometry and information theory, et cetera, et cetera, I'm sure I can do something interesting. A few lays, years later, I received an invitation for a conference in machine learning. And I thought, what is this? Is it a mistake? I don't know anything about machine learning, which is the working heart of artificial intelligence, the algorithms by which the machine can automatically learn from examples, from experience, or whatever. I called my friend who had gone into that. Do you understand why they invited me? And we discussed. And he said, no, no, they invite you because the kind of math that you have been doing, now they are doing also. I went to the conference, and I did my speech, and I uh, listened to the others, and I saw that it was completely true. In many of the topics of, uh, that they were uh, investigating about machine learning, it looked familiar. Not that my math has changed, but the topic, the math covered by artificial intelligence had been somehow uh, going into this. And uh, later, I remember, when I first had an encounter with Joshua Benjo, one of the popes of uh, uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence, and I started to explain to him, I'm on this mission for AI and so on. He told me, no, I know. I know you, I know your work. We've been studying some of your papers because we are convinced that it will be important. In short, for those who know, connection between uh, optimal transport duality and adversarial learning. So it was a big surprise to me showing that artificial intelligence was changing its working heart and for sure had turned much more to a combination of statistics and geometry than it used to be. And indeed, in those conferences in machine learning, I could not recognize any of the stuff that I had seen in the books in the 1980s about uh, ontologies, about the, about the reasoning, about the relation to cognitive sciences, etc., etc. On the other hand, this surprise was certainly very small compared to the huge surprise which fell on the political world in those years. A few years ago, if you were a head of state, you did not need to know anything about artificial intelligence. It was one field of research as another. You make sure that research has enough money that they don't complain, don't demonstrate. <laughs> and then you're OK. And you can think of important stuff, economy, the tariffs, the, the taxes, whatever. Nowadays, every head of state that wants his, who wants his country or her country to be an important player in the future is hardly thinking, gosh, how many billions can we put on the table for this artificial intelligence stuff? Otherwise, I will be doomed. What happened in between is that the efficiency of the field has been completely revised. What people thought was theoretical dreaming with maybe applications someday about understanding the depth of our conscience now is about efficient devices to boost your car industry, to boost your health industry, to uh, simplify and replace many different types of work. And so all of a sudden, it can be a game changer for a whole 
industry, for the whole economy, actually. And at the same time, what also changed is the relation of people, citizens, to these type of technologies with suddenly reports such as, ah, you know what? This internet thing that we use to communicate, now it has developed in such a way that we can manipulate millions of people into doing something that they don't need, voting for the wrong person, buying the wrong stuff. Or, you know what? This uh, technology it has developed in such a way that it might be possible to hijack and make some strange things for uh, life-supporting devices, for uh, automatic cars, in such a way that some attacks may be achieved that we have never heard of before. So all of a sudden, something that is not just science and technology, but also all the rest, economy, society, jobs, vision of the future, trust of the citizens, and so on. At a more specialized level, the techniques, to some extent, changed. And experts were all of a sudden not sure at all which was the right way to go. Most spectacular, maybe, manifestation of this was the revival of the neural networks. A few years ago, you would ask your best expert in computer science, the ones that was working, I don't know, in Ecole Normale Supérieure, what do you think of neural networks, artificial neural networks, which are these devices in which you emulate some operation, mathematical operation, with some input and some output, through a series of interconnected nodes, layer after layer of nodes, each node being able, a bit like a neuron in our brain, to receive a combination of outputs from other nodes and to send an output to some other nodes with a simple operation in between. And you would ask, what do we know about neural networks? How efficient are they? And the answer was simple. They would all tell you, we tried them already for decades. They don't work. They are inefficient. We have to go for something else. And it was in 2012 or something like this that, surprise, there were these algorithms that had been worked out and tried for the 80s and developed by Yann Lequin, Geoff Hinton, Yoshua Benjo, and their friends. And they managed to solve, to win one big international competition about algorithmics and to show in the years that would come that eventually neural networks were very efficient. What changed in this? First, the hardware to some extent has changed. Neural networks like the GPUs rather than the CPUs with some different way of handling operations in a more parallel way in some sense. Then, the, if it was about uh, identifying something from learning by examples, the databases which are used for, for furnishing the examples have become monster with the huge databases uh, that were prepared in particular by the big American platforms first. The computing power also increased and increased. Still, all this is not sufficient to explain why well, the algorithms that did not work now are working. And the people like Ian Lequin and the others will also tell you very humbly 
there are also some things that we don't know about the convergence of algorithms there. And we underestimated the efficiency of these algorithms. Or we always believe, for some reason, that they will be efficient, but we are unable to explain why. And probably something having to do with the way data from real world are structured, with big mysteries to be unraveled here. Mysteries that lie in the algorithmic, but in the understanding of the world in general. Another very striking discovery that was made in those days is that in many cases, phenomena that are extremely complex and depend on hundreds of parameters, eventually, for any given practical purpose, will boil down to just a few parameters, maybe 5, maybe 10, maybe 15, but not 100. And there is no good theory for this reduction, spontaneous reduction of complexity. Uh, some interesting simulations, uh, speculations by bright people, uh, but no theory yet. One of the spectacular examples was when models of personality started to emerge. Personality is such a complicated, multi-factor thing. And still arrived these models with only five parameters, reducing the personality to this, and which were proven to be very efficient in manipulating, in understanding, in classifying, in determining from your internet behavior, public behavior, uh, for whom you vote, what social professional category you belong in, it's what kind of message will make you react, is it better to frighten you or to reassure you if you for, to manipulate you, etc., etc. Just five parameters, it's a bit vexing. In this context, the international competition game has all of a sudden changed. And now we see that to do strong in the sense of very competitive AI worldwide, basically you need to be able to gather more than the others three ingredients. The first ingredient, big databases of examples of every kind of phenomena, which are still the most used method nowadays for artificial intelligence, even though not the only. Second ingredient is strong hardware computing facilities that compute fast, that handle uh, enormous amounts of data. And the third ingredient is human brains to operate this and be well aware, participate in the uh, research worldwide about this, be ready to do experiments, etc., etc. And this discovery that the, the rules of the game in some sense have changed arrived at a moment in which the uh, structure of the economy worldwide is one that was never known before, with emergence of a handful of monster uh, digital actors around the world, a few in the US, a few in China, and none elsewhere, which combine incredible amounts of data incredible amounts of computing power, and incredible amounts of money, which are, with which it's possible to hire an infinite amount of people to work on this, and to hire the best people with salaries that nobody would ever dream of in the academia. 
So realizing this is quite a big geopolitical shock. And also, for, the, for all the rest of the world, something rather scary. How are we going to handle this situation? And in the past couple of years, we've seen these papers appear, these covers appeared, picturing a new kind of Cold War between US and China, with the idea that the race is on to be the world leader of artificial intelligence, etc. And the rest of the world wondering how are we going to make it to stand up, to not be forgotten in this game, and to participate in a world in which trust is distributed, expertise is distributed, and decision centers are distributed around the world. This is the situation and the context in which the government asked me, French government asked me to work on a strategy for France. With the first, it was natural to take me as a victim, given the fact that I was already to some extent familiar with the subject, and mathematician by training in parliament, etc. At that time, there had already been a preliminary report on the AI in France, first report that was the first opportunity for the French government to see this subject. And there was already a UK strategy, which was being under study and development in UK, which in Europe was the first country to tackle this subject. Actually, historically, UK had been the first in Europe since the times of Turing. And nowadays, still, the Turing Institute is a very respected network of experts. I, uh, this mission took six months of my uh, political activity which, by the way, in France is the max legal maximum for a parliamentary mission. We put strong limits so that missions are fast. And uh, it was done in collaboration, strong uh, support with a team of six people that was helping me full time. One of the important things is that this team was made, say, half of people from science, like hard science, and half from people with more expertise from social and human sciences, like law, job market, society. It's this kind of combination nowadays that you need to tackle the subject of artificial intelligence. One of the people that worked with me was Mark Schenauer, that some of you probably know from INRIA, who has made his whole career in artificial intelligence and was working on it long before it became very fashionable. So with this team, we made auditions about hundreds of people. And where there were expeditions organized to other countries, like 10 of them or so. And we ended up with the report, with the strategy. One of the notable things is that we made publicity all along the duration of the mission with many interviews, television, newspapers, etc., which is quite unusual. Normally, for a parliamentary mission, you start communication only after the work is done and after you receive the approval from the government that you can go on and talk. But here, it was felt that the special nature of the subject was prone to communication during the process because there is an enormous public relation job that has been done, that has to be done for the field. Because it's a subject that scares people. And because some people take also good interest in scaring citizens about it. And building trust, uh, the idea of work in progress is a good narrative for building the trust. 
look, people, this is the mission. We're working on this. It's going to say, here is one of these hot topics. And here are the questions that we are asking. If you associate the citizen with the questions before you get the answer, uh, of course, it's much better. We also set up a collaborative platform and may uh, publicize it so that every citizen can make contributions if he or she wishes. And some of the best contributions, we invited the people corresponding to the parliament so that we can discuss with them and hear what they have to say, etc. It's one of these technological revolutions in which you have to uh, associate the society with you. Eventually, uh, when came the day of the official rendering of the report, there was not only presentation of the report, but a day of international conference with experts invited from all over the world in discussion, in public discussion with members of the government or people in responsibility in this subject in France. And there was speech by myself, of course, as explaining the results of the mission, insisting on three key words. The first one was experimentation, because it's a subject that developed so much experimentally, because some of the underlying science is still completely mysterious, and because also, it's a subject that society will have to do experiments with. The second key word was sharing, because it's a subject in which you can do progress by sharing the data, which in some cases is very difficult to build through trust, even when it's protected and so on but also sharing the skills because it's a subject that develops always through collaboration between the expert on algorithmic and the expert in whichever field you are trying to work on. For instance, autonomous cars require strong cooperation between experts in algorithmic and experts in car making. And it's not something like the car industry will uh, ask the algorithmic people, please uh, send me a software that does this, 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 and this. It's a subject that is developing very much in the sharing of skills between various disciplines. And uh, the third key word that I put was sovereignty. Sovereignty from the political uh, uh, point of view. Sovereignty doesn't mean that you are overcoming the world or trying to be the leader of the world. It means that you are not in being imposed things that you don't want, that you can decide, that you have tools which are up to the level that you wish and are not forced to take them outside. In this case, sovereignty can also be understood in a different way in the sense of society not being imposed uh, uh, things by the technology. Choose what we want to preserve in the society, what kind of values, what kind of relations between us. And sometimes it's very difficult because technology somehow imposes itself on us, and we are being led into doing things that we don't really want even though we may have the impression that it is our decision. Uh, the report resulted in a number of recommendations. Nowadays, it's in the hands of the government, who backed something like 95% of the suggestions. And it's a list of 60 actions that are being pushed by special inter-ministry coordinator, which was appointed especially for this. I will not describe them all, but insist on just a couple of them. OK. These recommendations touch upon industry and data preparation, in particular sets of public data that will have to be set up by the state 
research organization and in particular the setting up of institutes that will be mainly obtained by gathering existing forces and new forces on top of this with special funding, but also means for public relation and interdisciplinary cooperation. We insisted that the name of the institutes would contain interdisciplinary as a keyword because we have to push for the meeting of the various skills. And we already uh, identified these sites using an, an uh, external international jury to make the decision so that it will be in Toulouse, Grenoble, Nice, and Paris. Somebody was telling me moments ago that, yes, Grenoble. So it has been distinguished. Another set of recommendations concerns the evolution of the job market, with main recommendations to put emphasis on the training, on the experiments here also. You never know until you try whether it really works or not to apply such kinds of algorithms to such kinds of jobs. A set of recommendations was about the industry and identifying some key industries that would be pushed for by the government. Mobility, health, defense, and environment. Another set of recommendations was regarding the ethics. We'll talk more about it, in particular in the discussion, I guess. But first, we backed and promoted and approved the fact that Europe has turned into the regime of general data protection regulation, GDPR, which puts strong protection about personal data, something that was mandatory in the current context of distrust, especially viewed from Europe. Then we also will have some ethics committee, independent of the government, uh, made of respected experts rotating whose role will be to give opinions on very tricky situations, moral situations, whether it's possible or allowed to use such or such type of algorithm in such or that situation or which guidelines. We already have such an ethics committee for issues related to biology, in particular about organ transplant or issues related to human reproduction, etc. Also, developing research and actions concerning the liability, accountability, transparency, explainability, control of algorithms. Do they really do what they are supposed to do? Are they not putting bias that are unacceptable, discriminations, etc.? Also, there will be a special work on a subject that is not easy at all, which is inclusion for people who are making the AI. For instance, there is an extreme disbalance between male and female in our schools of computer science and algorithmic. When we have 15% uh, women in these schools, it's already quite good compared to the average, and that is not acceptable. Why is it not acceptable? Of course, there are plenty of sectors in which we see this proportion between the men and women. Some of these are tradition, cultural effects. Some of them are very uh, surprising. For instance, in high cuisine, chefs, is something like 99% men. 
in France, but I think worldwide, it's also very, very strongly tilted towards men, which is weird when you think that overall the world, there are much more women making cuisine than men. On the other hand, when you come to go to a school of electrical engineering, you will see huge proportion of men compared to women. But now AI is not any subject. It's a very special subject that is hot and in the front page of the newspapers. And people tell you that it will change the world, etc., etc. If we allow a situation to install itself in which it will be only men in this subject, or mostly, mostly men, the subliminal message that will be sent to society and to young girls and young boys will be clear. Oh, it's the men that are preparing the future of tomorrow, the world of tomorrow, and only them. And that is a disaster about the image that we have of men and women in the society. So we have to work actively so that in this subject, there is a strong proportion of female students, female entrepreneurs, etc., concurring in this narrative of we are going to change the world through this mixture of technology, economy, society, etc. Now, I think I talked a lot. Uh, the last minute I will spend is on the international strategy. France is very keen on pushing the agenda, using also its advantages, and in particular, strong expertise that is recognized in mathematics, algorithm making. France is very proud that it has something like 20% of the Fields medals ever awarded, uh, that it's with respect to all kinds of uh, measurement of international success in mathematics, uh, number one in the world if you take it into in proportion of the population. And very proud also that companies worldwide, including some of the most famous uh, Silicon Valley, companies use a lot of French brain to write algorithms. But very much aware also of the danger that it represents at a time in which almost every company wanting to do some AI internationally is planning or has already put a lab in Paris or in Paris area or elsewhere in France to profit by the good expertise and hire some of the French uh, experts in this. So with respect to this international competition, we will not protect things, but we have a huge challenge to reinforce the attractivity of our laboratories so that there is not a motion of escape, brain drain, that is too strong. Also, France will search for allies, and is already searching for allies worldwide, first and foremost at European level, for reasons of scale, of economic size. France will be unable to stand up the international competition in this subject alone. And almost no country will be able to do a competition by itself. We already talked about the big giants that will be able to do. For the, all the rest, alliances will be important. So that strong cooperation and discussion with other uh, continental actors has been made and will be made. A few days ago, I was in Japan for a joint French-German-Japan meeting in AI. 
And in particular, I had a lot of discussions with my German counterparts about how to tighten the links, make a joint French-German AI lab. The German strategy will be announced in a few days, actually, beginning December. European strategy has been announced and will continue, but will also be strong on the cooperation. And that, for us, will be a priority. Also, there will be collaborations with the rest of the world, for sure. But strong alliance at European level will be a priority. And eventually, with the idea to converge to a world in which great skills is shared worldwide and distributed, in which at political level, at scientific level, we see that there are some big centers around the world engaged in healthy competition, cooperation, and exchanges of knowledge, science, people. I will close here. It's almost exactly 11, so that we can start the, yes, the uh, panel and debate and round the uh, round table uh, uh, next. Thank you. Before we start the panel. Mm -hmm. okay. Any question? Mm -hmm. Be brave. Yes, over there. Do you prefer to be a mathematician or a politician? And uh -huh. do you think which position could help you contribute more into artificial intelligence? Uh, the first part of the question is tricky. The second one is easy. Uh, OK, when you're a mathematician, you're a mathematician for life first, I believe. Just the difference is whether you work actively in searching for theorems and uh, discussions and writing books or not. And uh, it's very different activity, mathematics and politics, extremely different. I would never have gone into politics without the mathematical uh, career, because this is what uh, led me to go into the public life and then in politics. Uh, it means politics was not on my agenda, by the way. If you asked me two years ago, do you want to be a member of parliament? I would have said, no, never, not for me. But sometimes life takes you in places that you did not expect. Uh, in my political career, I have continued to follow files and issues which I was interested in as a mathematician. There was the AI strategy. But also, I worked on the teaching of mathematics and was in charge of another mission, joint with another expert, about how to reform the teaching of mathematics in France, which currently is not what it used to be. We still have great experts, but for the whole, it's not satisfactory at all. One of the things that our action helped is to um, convince the ministry to introduce teaching of algorithmic from very early stage, like six years old kids and so on, something which we should have done from a long time, a long time ago, but which was blocked in France for various ideological or political reasons. Just helping on this file, this action alone would have been sufficient for me to consider that it was profitable to go into politics. But also, I could work on uh, in actively in convincing and helping 
the government to solve a problem of a memory problem related to Algeria war and uh, the emblematic fate of a mathematician who was killed and uh, by the uh, French army in the 50s as an emblem of many bad things which happened during the Algeria war. And this is also a file that I was following as a mathematician and which now has converged as me as a politician. Also this I am very proud of. I've been in charge of uh, renovating the parliamentary scientific office that you mentioned at the beginning. And I've been actively reforming it so that it become more, more efficient. Uh, so in all these, these are actions that are of political nature, strongly inspired by uh, my mathematical background. Apart from that, I am convinced that scientists should play a more active role in the politics. Uh, we used, it used to be the case at some point, in particular at the time of French Revolution, scientists were very much active in the politics. Some of them uh, did not have a good fate due to that. So some of them lost their head, literally. But they did have some important role in these complicated times. And I advocate for that there would be more uh, scientists going into politics, even though sometimes it's difficult. Now, about the contribution. Now, there is no, uh, it's easy to answer. As a, a scientist, OK, uh, I was not bad. But first, my main subject was not in AI, as I told you. I, my, it, uh, it changed somehow, and it's clear that it's a direction that at some point I will explore or have students explore connections between some of the mathematical stuff that I worked on and some of the trends in artificial intelligence. But there are a number of other excellent scientists that can contribute. While at the interface of science and politics, it's very, very reduced. Currently, I am the only uh, scientist in politics that is identifiable by the citizens as both a scientist and a politician. So it's a very special situation in which I believe I can have more impact than just being a scientist. Thank you. I actually have a pressing question following that. Uh, I'm very encouraged to listen to you talking about the need for more women in STEM and in AI as entrepreneurs and researchers. I remember being the electrical engineering student, uh, first day of college in the United States. I walk into a lecture theater full of guys, and there were two of us women. And when I studied in France, yeah. Uh, the situation was not better. I was at the engineering not better, school. Absolutely. I think in one promo, we had maybe three or four women. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, actually, the statistics is not encouraging because no. we're seeing a decrease. It's worsening. It's, it's worsening, worsening absolutely. in computer science and in AI. So since you're in a powerful position to make some policy changes in, in France, I wonder what are your uh, ideas and what uh, are your proposals to, to do something about this? Mm -hmm. What can we do? Uh, first, we have to be aware of this. At some point, we believed a few decades ago, like you know, these ideas of this fact of women doing this and men doing that is the result of segregation that there was in the past when women were not allowed to do this and that. But now that they are together in the schools, careers open for everybody, things will gradually smooth out. And there will be a good uh, sharing. And that's not the case. We have not seen it. In, and in Ecole Normale Supérieure, when there was a merging of the school for boys and school for uh, girls, it was a disaster in terms of how many women there would be. Right now, uh, on a promo of mathematicians like 40, when there, is, when there are two women, we consider it 
not a bad year. It's very sad. So, but you can see the phenomenon, this kind of automatic uh, segregation worldwide in various respects. Remember in America how it was an enormous fight for having, the, for, uh, having schools that would not be reserved for whites or reserved, mm -hmm. for, or reserved for black people. It was an enormous fight. But nowadays, you have, in effect, in many cases, schools that are entirely black or entirely white and surprisingly little mixing. So we have been discovering that social cliches, cultural constructions, invisible chains are very powerful. They reproduce themselves. And it's not enough to give people opportunities. You have to push them. Mm -hmm. So it's time to, to actively push. We saw it's been also discovered in the past decades that uh, supporting role models is not efficient. Mm -hmm. It's not enough to talk about uh, uh, Grace Hopper, to talk about uh, uh, Ada uh, Loveless uh, to talk of the great women scientists and typically the young girls say oh she's uh, she's great oh she's extraordinary but she's special mm -hmm. I'm not of this very special mm -hmm. type so to convince girls and to overcome prejudices you have to do it actively mentoring uh, going uh, on over and over again in Politics, by the way, we managed to have, for the first time in uh, French history, uh, a group, the majority group that is almost 50-50. And this was achieved by specifically acting, uh, uh, asking women to, to, to apply. Like, OK, we did not receive enough applications from women. Now we're making a special call for women who want to apply, and then another special call. Uh, we're still not perfect in this, as can be seen from the who we put in positions in responsibility inside, but at least for the composition of the group, we uh, achieved something that is really good by specifically targeting and uh, trying to convince the, the girls. So there will have to be this also for careers in computer science. Well, thank you very much for the comment. Yes, there's another question. There. Professor, how do you interpret consciousness in the context of AI? Mm. Um, consciousness is tricky, very, very tricky. Uh, one of our best French experts, Stanislas Dehaene, recently published a thick book about consciousness with things such as what is perception, analyzing the uh, illusions of uh, optics, uh, cognitive constructions, whatever, whatever. There are these fixed books, are, but we we'll still only scratch the surface, for sure. The real nature of consciousness is still a big challenge for science. One thing for sure is that current AI has nothing that is approaching in the least consciousness. There are, for the moment, no identifies barriers that one day, maybe, there will be a machine that has consciousness. And uh, it still raises a number of questions. What is relation of consciousness to perception? Relation of consciousness to embodiment? All these, for the moment, are completely out of the scope of uh, engineering. So really, it's a mystery. OK, another question there. Uh, thank you for your talk. So I have been to uh, your talks before. I think this is my fourth time. OK. Um, uh, pl please, pu put your microphone okay. closer. Oh, so this is my fourth time, almost. Okay, so the impression what I had that on the question of is mathematics is discovered or invented, I thought that uh, you emphasized on the discovery part. I mean, 
mostly on partial differential equation, mathematical physics, or Boltzmann equations, or Landau damping effect, and all those things. But today, I see a certain transition that you uh, left that part, the discovering some phenomena and explaining some phenomena in terms of mathematics, to certain manufacturing and inventing something. Now, <coughs> my question is that, what is the goal? I mean, so let, let's say I'm a mathematician, or what, what would be your address to the mathematical community? <coughs> For example, I am a mathematician, I can understand, I can say that, okay, I am trying to discover some phenomena, or trying to explain some phenomena. Now here, what do you mean by better tomorrow? Like, what is the goal actually? What we are discovering? What we are looking for? In AI? Yeah, I mean, especially this AI and uh, the new form of this mathematics. <laughs> uh, science is about discovering the rules of the world. AI currently is about improving productivity. It's not a field of science the way it has turned. It uses science, it motivates scientific problems, but for the moment, right now, the emergency and the reason why nations are competing is for the increase of the productivity. And the fact that it will also do some things, it uh, gives you new tools. Better tools for health, improving the well-being of people, for instance, the best software in diagnosis making, the best softwares are for several diseases about doing equal match with the best humans. So it's about improving the life. But really, if the original goal of AI was about understanding mysteries of the world, the current <coughs> emergency of AI business and so on is about improving things. And that's why some people will, some scientists already are angry with it, saying it's not a science, uh, etc. That doesn't mean that it's not interesting, of course. On the contrary, it poses great questions about the reasons of the efficiency and also great questions about what can actually be achieved, society, etc. One of the projects which most fascinated me, which was uh, the object of the uh, TED talk uh, not in the past session, but the previous one, is the project by Noriko Arai in uh, Tokyo, the Todai Robot, project that started 10 years ago. And there is a question like, okay, would a robot be able to pass the entrance university, the entrance exam of a university? In those days, very few people in her colleagues and in her class of AI believed that it, was, it would be possible in a reasonable amount of time. But now the robot is there. It, you give the subject to the robot, and the robot will, OK, write the essays, solve the math problems, etc. Currently, it it passes the entrance exams of something like 80% of the uh, Japanese universities. And in the mathematics test, the robot ranks in the top 1% of Japanese students. Of course, it doesn't mean much past the entrance university. I mean, that's a robot. Gosh, he's not a human. He doesn't understand what's a university, nothing. All the robot can do is make correlations with questions and uh, take bits of Wikipedia to write an essay, pretending it's intelligent but has no idea what he's talking about. But still, it makes better for the exam that the majority of students. And Noriko says, the big discovery for me was 
uh, how is it possible that our intelligent students perform so badly in the tests? <laughs> okay. All right. So um, uh, let's move on to the next session of a panel discussion. We have a very interesting panel today. Um, so we have um, Cedric Villani, who is a mathematician and politician today. We also have a uh, philosopher from Cambridge University, uh, Dr. Liu Yang here. And we also have the father of Sophia, the robot, uh, David Hansen. So I am looking for, oh, I will be also on the panel. I'm looking for, forward to some heated debate, I hope. And let me introduce our moderator, the Dean of Science and Mathematician as well, Professor Wang Yang. Yeah, so uh, it's a great pleasure uh, to uh, have this uh, panel, for me to moderate this panel discussion. I think we were a little bit behind the schedule. So, um, you know, so uh, we may, uh, because of, we may postpone the lunchtime a little bit. And also in the interest of time, I know there will be a lot of questions coming from the audience. Uh, I will start with uh, a question for each of the panelists. And uh, I'll try to uh, limit the uh, question, uh, the answer to four minutes, okay? So uh, my phone will buzz after three minutes, uh, uh, 40 <laughs> seconds, okay? So just, uh, you know the time to wrap up. And uh, uh, the, uh, Pascal has already introduced uh, the panelists briefly. So uh, uh, let me just uh, start, perhaps I can start with uh, Dr. Uh, Liu Yang, uh, Liu Yang, Yang Liu, uh, who is a Leverholm uh, Research Fellow and uh, the Lever in the Leverholm Center for Future of Intelligence at University of Cambridge, and uh, perhaps can I start a question. Uh, I'll start off with a question for you. So you have been a driver of the you know the Cambridge China connection that promotes East and West philosophy on the beneficial AI, okay? So uh, do you see a philosophical, cultural difference in how the East and West view on AI and especially related ethics issues? Okay, hi everyone, and I'm, I'm, I'm Jan, I'm from Cambridge, and uh, thanks Pascal and Dean for inviting it's me. Is it on? Okay. I think it's on. Oh, it's yeah. on. Yeah. So I, I work with, as the dean introduced, uh, work with this called Leverhulme Center for the Future of Intelligence. And so I give you a very brief history of, of the center, and then I will address mm -hmm. what we do at the center. So two years ago, Leverhulme Trust is a major uh, funding agency in, in, in England, and uh, you know, I put out a call, a call for a you know, funding call to establish centers to attack big questions. So we put up a proposal, and uh, the long story short, we want uh, we want uh, the funding. So it's a 10 million um, pound uh, funding the center for 10 years. So the center is, is the focus is to study, you know, the impact of uh, artificial intelligence, both in long and short terms. And uh, in the center, so it's been only two years, but uh, we have been very fruitful and we had uh, quite a few projects going on, you know, ranging from talking about, you know, uh, the technical issues in, for instance, transparency in AI, and to and the ethics and the more more questions in, in impact of AI. So there's another project we are trying to establish, namely the 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 we call that East and West collaboration of AI. As uh, as Professor uh, Valeni you know already mentioned that uh, you know in 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 this in, in 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 this time, so AI is a technology. It's very advanced technology. It's highly transformative technology. The rich will be you know reaching every corner of the world. It it doesn't you know care about the borders, the borders of each country, and there's a more reason. It's my, my time off? Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 it's my phone. It's, a, yeah. it's, a, it's a, actually a uh, harassment. Phone. Yeah, so, <laughs> <laughs> so it's more reason for us you know, to collaborate at an international level. So one motivation for us to do this project is that you know, we've seen that you know, 
uh, especially when it comes to talking about the impact of AI, especially in the English-speaking world. So the voice are dominated by Western countries and Western cultures. And usually people are saying that it's only the, the Silicon Valley white boys are talking about this. And we need to hear the voices of every corner of the world. Because of this kind of technology, we have impact of all the people in the world. So that's why we want to establish this kind of a program to establish you know, communication and a dialogue so from the East and the West. And another reason is that, you know, uh, so especially in the West, and when, when, when people talk about China, and mm -hmm. so the discussion is usually filtered through the medium. So especially in the States, and uh, you know, they have this, this you know, <laughs> we call the journalist the sensationalism. So whatever they're reporting about China, and you know, the chance is, is highly negative. And uh, and when it comes to talking about artificial intelligence, they're talking about either people don't care about the issues like a privacy, or they just don't want to put big money into the technology and the advanced technology. They don't talk about the social issues. They don't talk about ethical issues. To some extent, it's true. But uh, you know, but what we as academic, we want to penetrate this kind of a sensationalism. We want to establish real, candid conversation between the East and the West. That's why we want to establish mm -hmm. this program. Yeah. Do we have like? You have, have, to, have, yeah, you have time. You so have this time. is the one kind of thing I'm doing at the center. So me, actually, I'm, I'm trained as a mathematician, even oh, though my, mathematician my yeah, too. even though okay. my degree is wow, in philosophy. Wow, too many so, mathematicians on this. Yeah. Uh, this gives me an advantage. Yeah. You know, I have two hats. I have a mathematician hat and philosopher hat. So if your question is too hard, I'm going to change my hat to the other. So we also want to, you know, as I mentioned in the center, we have pro projects in, in ethics and philosophy of AI. What we also want want to build is a, a, a mathematical arm of the center to in investigating the, the, the mathematical and mathematical foundations of, you know, beneficial AI. Mm -hmm. Okay, I will. Yeah, okay, Th uh, thank you. Actually, I think uh, you probably will, uh, we can get to some of the main points you, I know you have a lot more to say. Uh, maybe later on we can take uh, a question from the audience. So, so um, next I would like to introduce uh, uh, David Hansen, who is the, the founder uh, of Hansen Robotics. And uh, of course, uh, he was, uh, his company is very well known for the creation of Sophia, which became the first robot citizen uh, in uh, Saudi Arabia in uh, 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 last year, right? And uh, so my question to, to you is that, uh, you know, your company has been at the forefront of making robots that look and behave like humans, okay? You build Sophia, and uh, for which you actually, when I look at the news reporting and everything, you, have, your, you and your company have received both accolades and criticisms, okay, for that particular, you know, for for the impact of Sophia and the other robots you create, both in terms of technology and ethics, okay. Now, um, can you walk us through some of the criticisms and uh, maybe, uh, you know, and your thoughts on them? And I, I think later I may even get uh, Professor Villani to uh, also comment on it, yeah. Sure, uh, thank you for having me here. It's a it's a real honor to be with you on this panel, and to to discuss these issues. Uh, Sophia is one of many robots that I and my team have developed. We have a diverse uh, uh, set of scientists, some mathematicians on our team. We have got uh, physicists. We've got AI developers. We've also got artists. We've got writers mm -hmm. and character designers. And so Sophia is the latest in a series of dozens of robots that we've designed, and she's the one that's become really most famous. Um, however, the idea of humanizing the robots is as much uh, turning robots into a, a medium of the humanities mm -hmm. and also, in that sense, a, the greater humanities, which is examining our place in the universe. Who are we and where are we going? Mm -hmm. So sim simultaneously, Sophia is a, uh, a piece of science fiction and character arts and a platform for scientific research into questions of 
Uh, how human-like can we develop artificial intelligence? How can we create machines that behave in human-like ways to do co-work, uh, perform education? Uh, how can we uh, then use these to examine questions of consciousness as an embodied form of artificial intelligence? So a platform for investigating these questions. Now, uh, you know, there's uh, some hazard there because, I mean, once you make a robot look like a human, then people start to react to the robot more than, than if it were merely a vacuum cleaner that looks like a hockey puck, for example, right? So, um, so there, there's a, prov a provocation associated with making this kind of robot. My hope is that it's provocative and inspiring, inspiring for, uh, for children to imagine the future of machines and machine intelligence, and provocative about um, asking you know, the deep questions. What does it mean to be conscious? What does it mm -hmm. mean to be, um, uh, to be human in, in a meaningful sense? Now, um, uh, the, a lot of the controversies that have sprung up have sprung up you know, unintentionally to myself and, and the team, even though you know, we, we seek to provoke. Uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia surprised us with an announcement of citizenship for Sophia, and it really wasn't wasn't fair. Our um, so our robots in um, as a real artificial intelligence can s generate some conversation. There's expert systems, sort of chatbot style expert systems. There's natural language generation, and mm -hmm. there's uh, some uh, some uh, com you know a little bit of common sense reasoning, but it's nothing like truly sentient. Um, uh, and yet it's enhanced by what we call this hybrid mode of operation where we will write words for Sophia. So we'll write words for events and then we'll let her answer some questions on her own simultaneously. So she's a character and she's got some real artificial intelligence together. So we send robot operators around the world with, ro with uh, Sophia robot. And uh, they uh, assured this one um, really wonderful robot operator uh, slash developer with a background in mathematics also, uh, uh, Winway. I assured him that this was like his, uh, it, it was okay with us. And the next thing we know, um, I see in the news that she's received a citizenship from mm -hmm. Saudi Arabia. I'm calling my chief marketing officer. Oh my God, what is this? What, what do we do? Do we, do we turn it down? I mean, this is like, you know, one of the most notorious governments on the planet. Um, she, she, she suggested to me, Jean Lim, she's really um, a brilliant, brilliant uh, woman who runs the whole Sophia personality and, and development initiative. She suggested, why don't we have Sophia speak out on these issues? Why don't we have her take this as a way of bridging you know, the, this region of the world in the Arabian Peninsula and, and the rest of the world? So Sophia spoke out about women's rights, yes. human rights, rights of foreign, foreign workers, and she, she does it diplomatically, but she stands up for these things. Um, now it's debatable, and she's received a lot of criticism for that. We've received a lot of criticism because people sometimes will assume that Sophia is conscious or sentient, even though we disclose it. You look at our literature on it, and we're like, she's not sentient. Mm -hmm. We're aspiring to make her sentient. She is, a, in a way, this uh, you know, a representation of human intelligence in the same way that animated characters are, or literary fiction will be. Mm -hmm. um, so we've got many of these controversial elements, but she is a genuine platform mm -hmm. for the investigation of human cognition, human-like cognition in a synthetic form. So, um, so I, I welcome uh, the, the, the opportunity to, uh, to address these controversies. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, David. Actually, um, you know, I, I, I do know that Sophia has spoken up on women's rights in Saudi Arabia of all places. And I wonder whether her citizenship will be terminated uh, or whether there will be a 50-man uh, squad coming to dismember her. <laughs> Possibly, but, you know, if when her head is detached, usually you can reattach it, unlike with humans. So she can continue to speak no matter, no matter what they do. <laughs> okay, so uh, uh, my, my next uh, question will be uh, to uh, Professor Villani. Um, Actually, I was going to ask you a question um, 
but uh, one of the audience already asked about your political, you know, how the transition from being a mathematician and scientist to a politician. So, uh, but I still want to ask you, you know, so maybe a, a follow up, you know, if you do you have any advice on some, if some of our students or, you know, people in the audience have a political aspiration, okay? And the other thing is, of course, you've been very, you know, you've been uh, on the policy side of AI ethics, and uh, uh, do you have any also comment on, you know, Sophia and uh, the uh, <laughs> what David just said? Thank you. Uh, about young people who like to go into politics, I, first about my own experience, viewed from my side, it resulted from a combination of unique things. There was this very chaotic election that we have in 2017 with a lot of scandal and nobody knew how it would turn out. There was the surprise emergence of a movement that corresponded to some of my uh, some of my choices like avoid the traditional uh, left right division or uh, promote Europe actually I knew uh, Emmanuel Macron uh, from several years before he ran for uh, election so there was this combination of features that made it that I went in there, plus a little bit of randomness, let's say. Uh, and uh, without this, I'm not sure if I had done it. Still, I believe it's good to have more scientists in there with the following rules. One first is to try and use the expertise from the previous life in the next one. One rule is to uh, be very well aware that the rules of political debate are quite different and much more violent than the rules for political, for uh, scientific debate. Okay, controversies can be very heated in the scientific world also, but it remained you know, these are controversies, like you are in the lab and you fight, we have to hire these people, no, it's those people, blah, blah, blah. But as soon as you're out of the lab, you forget it, you are in a family, whatever. Controversies in the political life, they are like with you all the time. They are on Twitter, sometimes millions of people see them, you go with them, and it remains as something, you know, how will people react, etc. When you are aware of this, and then you accept it and you get used to it somehow. Like, okay, what's it? Oh, and the newspaper talking about me, who cares? Okay, let's continue, etc. You get you get really used to this weird thing. Or some things like, oh, that's the this big day newspaper. Oh, this they are talking about the secret conversation that I had with this guy. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, they tell lies. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, who cares? Uh, it's a particular uh, feeling and uh, that, you, that you will have to develop. And it also shows with uh, our relation with communication. We are in very troubled time for communication and technology brought us the power to communicate but need not give us the harmony, you know? And uh, communication nowadays is way more violent than it used to be. Uh, even 10 years ago. I, you know, it reminds me of when I was a student in, uh, in Ecole Normale Supérieure in the, in the beginning 90s, there were the, the internet was a new thing for most of us. And there were these internal forums of discussion, internal to the school, in which you could say contribute to a debate on this topic, whatever, etc., etc. And inevitably, discussions we saw were degenerating into flame wars with people hurling at each other much more violently than in the real life. And 
I remember people telling me, some uh, friends who are not so keen on this, never go in there, Cedric. This is like, this forum is uh, the, the devil. And now it's like the whole world has turned into forum. Mm -hmm. And the possibility that the technology gave us to go into debates without the appeasement signals that our biology uh, puts when we are in real conversation is monster. Now we have every day, so uh, there is insult, injury, etc. One of our, our digital, our minister for digital uh, recently was on the news saying, imagine how it would be if people on the bus would talk as they do on Twitter. It would be like, get out of this, you fuckhead, I don't want to see you, etc. <laughs> Or pardon my French, or your French, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. Okay, I think I uh, talked too long, and maybe I reserve the next question, the next question for another occasion. Okay, so uh, actually I do want to uh, mention that uh, Professor Villani uh, visited Georgia Tech right after he graduated. So I was a professor there, and I, I remember him, okay, he was a... Uh, you know, I, at the time, I could see him being a fantastic mathematician. He was very, very sharp, and uh, he's, uh, the people he visited, very good people, they all say good things about him. I, I, actually, I think I even went out for lunch with you once, uh, but I never imagined he would be a prominent politician today, okay? So, <laughs> um, all right, so my uh, final question, then we open the floor up, uh, will be to Pascal, and uh, I think Pascal is someone I don't need to introduce. She's been a fixture at, on campus for a long time, and uh, um, so, uh, and I also want to use the opportunity to highlight uh, what, you know, our university, and especially Pascal, has been, you know, leading this effort on AI in this university. So, uh, Pascal, my question is, so now we have CARE, uh, which stands for Center for AI Research. And, uh, uh, but I, when I, last time I went to uh, Georgia Tech, for instance, they also have a center of big data AI. And I went to China, every university seems to be having one, okay? So even on our campus, we also have a big data institute. So, um, so how would you, I mean, what, what do you think, I mean, what do you plan to do to, uh, to make care uh, so distinguished from some of the Me Too kind of, uh, you know, or just a, another AI center, yeah. Um, so thank you for the question. Uh, just, let me just first I'll say this, uh, make a claim here. I think care, by its name, there's a little person in the middle so it's a human-centered AI, and I think all AI should be human-centered and beneficial. And I would say our center is probably the most, if not the only, inclusive center for AI research in the region, if not in the world. Most other, care, uh, most other AI centers, the big data institutes, are based in School of Engineering or Science and so on. Um, our center, as you all know by now, that spans over school of engin engineering, science, business, as well as social science and humanities. Our associate director, Professor Kelly Tsai here, is a prominent social scientist. So why do we do this? Because we believe that AI technology, as mentioned earlier by other panelists, impacts our daily life, impacts all corners of the earth and all industries. As such, everybody is a stakeholder in this AI development. Everybody is a stakeholder. Men, women, scientists, engineers, business people, philosophers, writers, artists, designers. Everybody is a stakeholder because it is about building the future for humanity. So we need to do it together. To say that, it, we cannot just pay lip service. We actually have to actively bring people from all walks of life to collaborate together. So I'm very proud to tell you that under um, the care infrastructure, we have fostered uh, several joint proposals across different schools already in the area of medical care, uh, financial, uh, financial fintech. Uh, we just uh, submitted a joint proposal on AI governance and uh, ethics. 
we sponsor um, debates in terms of AI and ethics. Mm -hmm. Today was not about a te technology discussion today. IAS talks are usually about science and technology, but today we're talking about ethics and principles, sorry. And uh, we collaborate care also with artists, uh, with uh, futurists like David, but also artists from the, you know, for example, Central Academy of Fine Art in China, and so on. So I hope we we are actually playing a, a, a um, uh, set an example of how AI should be done. It should be cross-disciplinary. It should be multi-stakeholder. And uh, of course, we hope that uh, what we do will also influence others. So we, I look forward really to more interdisciplinary projects and uh, look forward to more debates and active involvement in all aspects of AI. And I invite the audience members who whatever aspect of AI you're interested in to collaborate with us. Um, to, to, to date, I should mention also that the Chinese state government has issued a white paper on uh, AI development. In among which, which is very important, there's a committee working on ethical standards in AI. There's actually an ethical standard committee on AI, uh, led by our friend, uh, Professor Liu Zhe from Beijing University, that I hope to invite to talk about here as well. So there's active uh, discussion and work uh, on the East-West collaboration of AI standards and ethics uh, in different, and there's a uh, active um, collaboration in between scientists and engineers and social scientists and humanists on AI as well. So perfect. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's great. Uh, thanks. Yeah. You know, it's typical uh, with this kind of rule time. Women will be on time and the men will always overcome the limit and go for more, etc. It's like when we do panels and we invite, we call up the men, do you want to participate? They say, oh, I have so many things to do, but I will do an effort. And women will tell you, oh, I have so many things to do. And they will, I have to be reasonable. That's one of the problems, with natural tendency of men to be unreasonable and, uh, uh, okay, it doesn't improve the situation. Yeah, I think having been here for 21 years, I think my reputation is not really reasonable. <laughs> As a woman, I've taken a lot of heat for being pushing for pushing the envelope, I believe. But I appreciate that comment. And I hope uh, women in this room are he hearing it and more women will hear this from the videos, yeah. all right? We should not be reasonable. Mm -hmm. So uh, let me say, I, I've seen so many centers uh, in all kinds of universities. I mean, all kinds of center in a university. We have many, many centers here. Uh, you know, I have never, I, I shouldn't say never, but I rarely seen someone who who has so much enthusiasm and who pushes so hard as Pascal in trying to make care a real, you know, a very uh, impactful center, okay? So please do continue to push the envelope, okay? So uh, now um, I think uh, we should open the floor up. Uh, that's part of the plan. And I want the audience to um, uh, keep the question short, okay? So let's not have a three minutes question, just a short question. And also like the panelists to uh, uh, keep the answer within four minutes, preferably uh, shorter, okay? And uh, the question can be addressed to a particular panelist or just a general question and let me, you know, designated to a panelist, okay? So now let's open the floor up. Thank you. Uh, so I have a question for Cédric Villani, as a, the only politician on the panel. Uh, so you described French strategy for uh, IA in terms of uh, international strategy. So my question is uh, regarding, um, will IA be a vector of more uh, inequality in the world when you think about the fact that you will have countries with IA and countries without it, and maybe the a new uh, third war, third um, world without IA. Um, there's there are several points of view, generally speaking, about the impact of 
technology on inequalities. And basically speaking, two kinds of situation. One situation in which technology comes to uh, break a monopoly or make it that everybody is allowed something that uh, was in a particular niche before, etc. And then it will turn to more, uh, to lessen the inequalities. And the other possibility is when the people who profit by the new technology are those who already have some power and uh, the equipment, etc. And then it increases inequalities. There is no absolute consensus, but still, there is somehow consensus that AI is more in the second category. That is, if we leave it as be without political action, or if we leave the various uh, each uh, player uh, take care of it without the need for global coordination, it will increase inequalities. Inequalities in the society between those who profit and those who are uh, being used by. Inequalities between companies, companies that can get it and those who, who don't take the turn. Inequalities between countries, between the countries that will have this on top of their wealth already and those who cannot. This is, the, this is also the point of view that was advocated by Cathy O'Neill in her famous book, Weapons of Math Destruction. Um, she was talking about inequalities within the society and in particular inequalities within the US society. But, and uh, she was exemplifying her thesis with many examples, some of which are very striking. But part of the discussion can also be taken to the upper level as a vector of inequality between countries. Actually, uh, one of the one uh, senior politician of Hong Kong with whom I was having a discussion a couple of days ago was telling me AI is an extraordinary inequalizer. It spontaneously will increase inequalities. That's probably, uh, I concur with this view and that's why we have to actively work for the re-equilibration. Work on the ethics, but also think about the economic model, about what to share, etc., etc. And um, uh, to some extent, politics is about not letting things be the way they would turn out to be naturally, what interventions are needed so that things turn out to be good. Uh, there is a common saying saying that progress has to be shared. Otherwise, if you have too strong a rift between people who get their part of the progress and the rest, there is a breakdown. It may be uh, in extreme cases, civil war, it may be uh, some uh, decision, maybe, and some of the most famous votes of the past years that were controversial, that turned out to elect in very prominent positions some very controversial leaders, for sure can be attributed to the feeling of entire parts of the population who feel they have been left out of the progress. And left out being, meaning I have this idea that people near me are profiting and that I am not, and it is this perceived or true inequality that is at the start of the rift. Um, thank, you, thank you very much. So uh, some researchers in AI, like uh, Julia Paul, they, 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 are, they are arguing that the AI we talk about today with machine learning at its core is just fitting curves, albeit powerful curve fitting. In other words, it's trying to find correlation rather than causality, so maybe. 
And they are trying to say, one step further is to enable machines to do causal inference. So I want to know your opinion, especially you have a mathematician, uh, mathematician philosopher today. Uh, what's your opinion on this uh, causality correlation, uh, this distinction? Or, or, or maybe, I mean, causality is just a, a strong correlation with some random human assumption? Yeah, I want to know your opinion on that. Okay, uh, Dr. Liu. Okay, I will put on my philosopher hat for a moment. <laughs> so, you know, in, in philosophy, so this is a very coarse distinction. So, historically, there's a, when it comes to reasoning or a scientific discovery, there's obviously the de deduction and the induction, the human approach or the lo logical approach. So, at the beginning of the, uh, an artificial intelligence research, it's dominated by the symbolic logic. So, it's the logic approach. We do the, the logic, we do the deduction. It is only in recent years, you know, we use more and more data and a probabilistic approach. That is the inductive approach. So the inductive approach, there's a specific question about, as you addressed, causation. What caused what? So there's, uh, you know, and there's uh, usually is a so the the, the the popular model is the Bayesian network, where you you use a probability to address the ca causality, the question of causality. You use a probabilistic kind of a network to a address this. But in recent years, especially when it comes to machine learning, you use a huge amount of data, and there's a lot of uh, you know, question about transparency. That is, you have a black box kind of a phenomena that you're feeding a lot of the data, and you have uh, you have a decision you know being made. So something you know. So philosophers obviously talk about you know cause effect kind of explanation when it comes to causality, but something that f philosophers are being questioned as to how do you give explanation when, you ha when you're facing this question of uh, transparency. I know Pascal is shaking your head and you have a different view, but I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a, a philosopher working on this aspect, but I know of my philosopher friends, they are being concerned with this type of a, a question about causality. That's why we, we, we're actually running workshops you know, addressing this type of a question. So I, I'll talk more about the details about these workshops, mm -hmm. but I will hear your opinions about uh, this type of yeah. question. Okay, Pascal. I think, I think being the only engineer on this panel, I would like to address that question, if you don't mind. Um, so I've been in speech recognition and natural language processing since 1988, so 30 years. And I can say what we do is not just mere curve fitting. It's not at all. You can try f to fit curves and you will never get to where we are today. Well, we have very, very good technology that can recognize human speech, that can translate human language, that can summarize a news article and all that. Why, why is it not just curve fitting? Let me just use one example. I don't know what your background is, but um, in my class on deep learning for NLP, I talked about different kind of deep learning architecture. Uh, one of which is uh, the convolutional neural network, which is invented by our common friend, Yang LeCun. Convolutional neural network was not just a curve-fitting tool, for example. There's a reason why there's a convolution in the first layer when we treat signals, when we treat vision, when we treat speech signals. Because, in fact, we understand hum human vision system pretty well. We don't understand human cognitive process that well, but we understand the physics of human vision system and human auditory system, how we hear sounds pretty well. So we actually know that we, our uh, human ears, for example, decompose uh, in incoming signals into different frequency bands. And our human ears actually uh, does something uh, that these neural networks try to mimic. So there's a physics model behind it in a lot of the things we do. And in natural language, for example, people say, oh, today natural language processing or machine translation is just input-output. You know, input-output was at the fun fundamental uh, um, disruptive uh, idea in machine translation more than 20 years ago when, we f when people at IBM and Bell Labs where I worked first thought about we could use information theoretic methods. Just like transmitting a signal uh, in a wireless communication way, where you transmit a voice from one end to the other, uh, a French sentence is perceived, it could be, no, a French sentence is represented as a distortion of a signal of the English sentence, if you imagine. And it turns out any language could be represented as a distorted signal of any other language. 
So there's actually real mathematical models behind this and how we do it. We're not just blindly fitting models. So one of the most important thing in, in AI is not just the model we use and the curve we're fitting, but what we call the representation. How do we represent the problem? The fact, the genius part of machine translation is not that we're using this deep learning model or that deep learning model. The genius part was done at the IBM group when they saw this problem as a signal, a distorted signal. So every AI problem, the first uh, insight comes from how you cast that problem into uh, a certain kind of representation. And that takes experience, that takes science, that takes um, sometimes knowledge in linguistics, other times knowledge in uh, physics. Mm -hmm. So it's not just a blind curve fitting. Who could never get where we are otherwise. Okay, thank you. Um, okay. Thank you very much. I have a question. Yeah. So, um, uh, Pascal, uh, that um, knowledge is from the humans, right? So it's really um, ec uh, effectively expertly crafted knowledge models. The um, so the 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 question uh, uh, um, is like moving past uh, you know statistical machine learning and uh, um, uh, towards machines that know machines that understand machines with imagination and uh, maybe another common friend uh, Gary Marcus has uh, at NYU has proposed along with um, others in the field um, Ben Gertzel uh, uh, mathematician who's chief scientist at Hanson Robotics but also very prominent in um, in the world of of AI, um, they have proposed a model uh, that uses um, a uh, an explicit reasoning, explicit knowledge representation plus statistical machine learning to create a kind of automated scientist that asks questions about the world and reevaluates the knowledge models, explicitly representing knowledge that may be emergent in the in the statistical machine learning. Um, so how, how are you uh, working towards that? How do you see that future? These are, two, these are two models. One is a symbolic, neural symbolic hybrid or statistical symbolic hybrid. Um, uh, others have proposed that, that semantic representations or knowledge, rep knowledge models may automatically emerge from statistical processes. Um, which, I mean, maybe that's the way the human brain works, right? Uh, sort of through genetic evolution. What, what, how, oh, it, it seems like that there has to be some change because there are only so many people can, that can invent this with these kind of breakthrough moments of genius. And that, um, there, there would be um, a, a real revolution in computing if machines start reinventing themselves. Um, so I take that as a question of um, which approach I prefer, or um, is there a way of reconcil reconciling the two of them? So my career, when I started in, um, actually most of us working on AI today do not call ourselves AI. We don't talk to each other and say, you are AI system and my AI system. We don't actually use that term. We always say, we talk about the particular models we're using, we talk about pattern recognition, we talk about statistical modeling. Uh, we don't actually use the, uh, the wording AI. There's a reason. Because all the systems you're seeing today that are working, that's being deployed, and um, they are called data-driven systems. That's why there's the term big data, and AI is trained on, AI systems are trained on this data. So this approach of trusting data uh, started um, about 20, 30 years ago uh, in fields of uh, speech and then language and, and vision because we try for many decades to trust human experts to uh, program or to, em or to encode explicit rules of human expertise in an attempt, I would say at the time, a really a failed attempt in to imitate human thinking process. Uh, I'm not saying that we will never get there, but whatever we tried before didn't get us to where we are today. So 
then we, uh, some of the engineers, uh, we start to say that we need to trust data. We can't trust what humans can think of as rules, but we need to trust data. And let's see what we can learn from data. So whatever human expertise there is should be reflected in the data. So for example, how humans translate text. So let's learn from existing translated text of English, French, for example. Uh, we don't know how human actually translated them, but we can learn from vast amount of translated data. So this is a very different approach. And the only approach I know, because that's, I was trained as an engineer and signal processing person, just like many of other people who are in our field today. So the field of natural language processing, for example, went from 20 years ago when I first presented my first paper in the area as an engineer, I was yelled at. People were saying, you know, you guys are not doing understanding. And we're saying, we're just doing engineering, that's okay. But today, in our field of natural language processing, that is the mainstream approach. There's only mathematical models. There's no more linguistics. So now I'm saying, let's, let's, let's look at the linguistic a little bit. Perhaps we can, the pendulum has swung so far to the other side. Let's look at maybe human knowledge a little bit. So, but how do we look at, it's not, it's not clear. So I'm sure there's a back and forth, like, and different new ways of looking at these problems. Uh, let me make a comment there is, uh, between the, the, the two answers that uh, Pascal uh, gave us uh, in relation with the question. Uh, the question was a bit ambiguous in the sense that uh, curve fitting may uh, stand for a lot of things and one may argue that whenever there is data that you try to make something that reproduces them, you are doing curve fitting eventually in a very large space with some rules, the curves in the, in the case of deep learning being convolutions, a piling of a number of signals and may it end up to be in a space of one million parameters or things like this. But what is there and underlying both is that uh, before you say, oh, this is data-driven, so just reproducing, you have to ask yourself, what is the model that I want to work with? The tools, the representation. And the big um, merit, maybe, currently, lies at least as much in that first step as in the actual resolution, fitting, reproduction, whatever. Is it this way of formulating, Pascal, is okay with you? Okay, I am thank a you. very inclusive, open-minded person. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, thank you. So, uh, thank you. because I see so many hands being raised, so I'm going to cut the question time and uh, answer time together to three minutes, so the buzz will, will buzz. So, because, so I can come, because we don't have much time left, so we can come to as many people. Next, please. Thank you. Um, so, improvements in AI and robotics um, are highly disruptive and uh, what can you to be for the foreseeable future? Uh, this begs the question of whether current mediums of education are still appropriate. And I was wondering, do you think that education needs to evolve? And if so, in what ways in order to best prepare uh, students for the future? Oh, um, just a general question for the panel. Absolutely. Um, CARE is also organizing a uh, AI for Good Summit next year, and uh, one of which, uh, one of the themes will be on education. How do we educate the AI workers, the AI professionals of the future? Because, you know, in my career I've seen engineers, 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 which is to the point, it's kind of ridiculous. Imagine the stuff you're using, the smart speakers, how you talk to a machine, uh, all designed by engineers. What do we know about you know, human psychology and user interface. We, we don't know. Signal processing guys, how, what do we know? But we are the ones who design these products. So it's ridiculous. So we need to educate our engineers in a more humanistic way. And we also need to educate our humanists in a more engineering way to have more scientific thinking, to be able to tell this is, you know, real and, you know, real AI and this is bullshit, excuse me. Um, so. We need to have more interdisciplinary education. We certainly need to reform our curriculum. Today, our curriculum is still very segregated. Talk about segregation. The engineering curriculum and the, um, the humanistic curriculum and 
science club, they're all very segregated. We need more interdisciplinary classrooms. We need more people doing double degrees, triple degrees. And uh, we need more people going to exchange programs all around the world. And uh, that, you know, tomorrow's universities might be a kind of virtual university. There will be physical facilities like we have today, but the student bodies will be like moving around. I hope, all right, so that's, I hope that I will see that happen. And okay. anybody else? Do you want comment? to? Yeah, I would just com comment a little bit on what you just said. So, so there seem to be like um, people are talking about a, you know a separation of labor, so to speak. So, it is the job for a scientist or the engineers to advance the science and you know technology. It is the job of philosophers, you know, uh, <laughs> social sciences. Yeah. To think about the ethics, to, to think about you know, the, the consequences, the impact of it. That's not the case. So for one thing, you know, philosophers, me, for the mere fact that we're so ignorant about technology, we, we can never catch up with the advancement of technology. So it's also true for policymakers. So what we want to do, the one solution is through education. So it is this, this kind of a constant nudging that we want to develop technology, you know, sciences towards a very positive future. So it is this kind of a nudging will make big effect in, in, the, in the far future, yeah. Thank you. Um, question? Yeah. Oh, so uh, this is a general question. So um, can, uh, for the panel, so can, can you um, say some specific example that hasn't appeared today, but you think people should use artificial intelligence to achieve for better tomorrow? So maybe I can ask uh, David to answer this question. Sure. So uh, the, uh, I would say artificial intelligence um, uh, has a has a, a role to play in um, uh, estimating uh, value. One one thing that I, I would really love to see is um, uh, a a broad interdisciplinary approach to uh, a kind of internet of artificial intelligence that estimates knowledge in in the world. This could be like a, 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 an international resource mm -hmm. because. Um, because right now, companies are using it to estimate value to maximize their next quarter's profits. So it's really about this local abundance in the hands of business people. And there's a natural tendency for the, for the fruits of that work to accumulate in, in a very, the hands of a very few people, which could destabilize international politics. It could, um, it's not necessarily for the betterment of the world. Um, and really what you're seeing there is uh, is the extraction or mining of knowledge or value from some particular data set that then delivers a benefit for for um, for some narrow or small group um, but that knowledge extraction that f finding of hidden patterns could be pooled into a network. Some of it could be implicit, some of it could be explicit knowledge, hidden knowledge. You could, you might you, be able to find the, the statistical trends of a particular protein marker in cancer, um, but you could also maybe figure out the cause of it. Why? The mechanism of the, of the actual proteins and their folding. And then, um, and then share that with the world, not just for one pharmaceutical company. So a network of AI could also look at system-wide um, interactions among various domains of, of knowledge. So I would say um, educating uh, the world on this, looking at a, a kind of, a, a almost like a, a a common highway of AI and knowledge and the intersection of that. That actually, for me, represents the replacement of money. What is money but a placeholder for value for human life, for life and its, and, and its network of, of food that feeds us and houses that protect us from the elements, right? This kind of thing. But AI could be the new money if you had this international representation. Um, so... Um, I, I, I didn't hear the buzzer, but uh, uh, you still have a, a few seconds. Uh, <laughs> so, but if you conclude, we'll be the first one without the buzzer. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, so the, uh, yeah, I, I'll, I'll wrap it up quickly. The, um, the key, though, for humans for discovering knowledge seems to be not merely learning, but playfulness, creativity. 
And that's in education and in our interplay with our algorithms. And so that playfulness, uh, um, to answer the previous yeah. question and tie it into this one. Oh, thank, you. thank you, thank you. I just so, wonder, can we get a question from a woman? Yes. Um, so I'm, I'm a, a business person. I know nothing about mathematics and all that. Um, but, but I'm very intrigued by what's going on and sitting where, where I am, uh, I kind of see the US model as the technology and the data belonging to businesses. And the Chinese model is the data and the systems belonging to the government. Um, and somehow I have a perception, I'm French, so I have a you know, bias, but I see the European model moving towards the data belonging to the individuals. Uh, so kind of like three very different models. Um, and uh, I, I'd like with, to see what your take is on, on that, Monsieur Professor Villani. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Uh, the French doctrine, and I believe the European doctrine, is not that data are possession of the individual. It's a more complex construction, as data is more more should be thought of as a common good whose use is controlled by the individual. It's a common good because it can serve progress for everybody when it is combined with the rest of data. My data individually has no value, but the combination of thousands of data can bring through statistical examination, correlation, looking for weak signals, whatever, some progress for the whole good. So uh, it is something that belongs in the community. However, because of the intimate nature of the data sometimes, because it brings information to me, and because I have a fundamental right for privacy that is inscribed in the list, in the chart of European uh, big principles, then I can control the use that is made of this data. I cannot sell it, I cannot make personal profit about my data, but I can control whether it's used or not. That is the doctrine. In particular, uh, we are not moving to a model of each individual negotiating how much the, the data is worth, uh, his own data is worth, etc. At least for the most critical data, those related to health, uh, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a tricky issue. First, remember that um, Europe is still at an unconscious, and sometimes conscious level, uh, traumatized by the Second World War and the files, racial files and so on. That makes it clear why there, there is a sensitivity towards the data file in Europe that is nowhere else in the world. When you are visiting a US universities, it happens that at the end you have a questionnaire to fulfill in which you have to say, are you Caucasian or etc. I received this questionnaire and I said, there is no way I'm going to answer this questionnaire. Of course, everybody sees I'm Caucasian, but I'm not going to write it on any record. It's just impossible. And then they will ask back, no, no, we have to, and they will say, first, uh, we have to fill the Excel file, that's a very common uh, motivation by the administration, but also they will say we have to use it to fight against the bias and discriminations and notice them. And that is a fair argument, and there is a real debate in there. If you are forbidden to register the denominations, how will you be able to discover the biases. Okay. And the health is also an issue. Mm -hmm. For sure, ethnic origin data are important for healthcare because we are not equal in front of cancer or other disease. Uh, okay, so long, as you see, it's a long debate. Data is a complex issue. Yeah. 
Thank you, thank you. That's a very, very nice answer. So, uh, uh, in the interest now, we'll take one last question. So you have, yeah. Uh, can we have a microphone? Yeah, you can use. It. Yes, a very short question. I wonder if the panel could comment on the impact of artificial intelligence on the concept of responsibility when decision making and decision taking. Mm -hmm. Do you want to address a particular panel? panel I think. Okay, yeah, okay. So maybe uh, prof uh, Dr. Liu? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the responsibility, yeah. Okay, from, so I can answer the question from two aspects. So, coincidental and decision theorist. So that's my area. So, at the Center for the Future of Intelligence, we have like a project. It's called the Decision Theory and uh, the Future of Intelligence. So, in this project, so we're actually you know investigating as to what kind of decision decision theory need to be embedded when uh, within the AI system to address the issue of, for instance, transparency and, uh, and equality. So that's highly theorized, uh, you know, at a very theoretical level. And, uh, you know, f when it comes to, you know, uh, the, my other head, and uh, when I talk about, you know, uh, the cross-cultural decision-making when it comes to AI and AI technology, so what we want to, uh, we want to do is, you know, to, to again to foster this kind of a dialogue, and uh, because, for instance, uh, an, an autonomous vehicle car made by the Chinese car company, so when it when they got a program and they sell to the U.S. or the European market, you have to, you know, because of the nature of the algorithm, you have to, you know, comply with the local ethics and comply with the rules. So this kind of a, you know, uh, decision making at the corporate level need to be very subtle, and that's why we need to encourage this kind of a conversation to talk about ethical issues and across different regions of the world. Mm -hmm. So I yeah. would just leave it. Okay, thank you. Um, anyone would like to uh, supplement? So um, there are two aspects to decision making. AI is nothing but making classifications and decisions. So if we want to use AI at all, there's some form of machine decision making, which scares a lot of people, which I understand. Now, um, humans, we feel like we're losing control if we're not the ones making explicit decisions. But in fact, we don't really make decisions every day on our own, right? I take an airplane and the airplane, the pilot, you know, the pilot decides where to go or whatever, but actually a lot of um, machine, machinery or uh, electronics is working in the airplane to take me from point A to point B, and I'm happy it's making that decision for me. The, th the problem is when does that decision become an ethical one? and a legal one, such as in autonomous vehicles. And mm -hmm. people talk about this AI dilemma of killing this passenger to, sell, to, to save the other one, right? This is the stuff of nightmare that we live with. And today, I can say that there was a case where, um, a, sorry, a, a, a computer, um, actually machine translation system that made an error, which translated uh, good morning in Arabic posted by Palestinian on, the, on Facebook into something like kill them all. And the, that person was arrested uh, by mistake. And that was an error by machine translation. That, that, that kind of thing really, really scares me and makes me feel <laughs> very responsible because we, we're coming up with algorithms that are never 100% accurate for sure. And it, it makes this kind of errors that can cost somebody's lives, right? Mm -hmm. So I can assure you, we, we cannot sleep um, thinking about these problems. That's all I can say, that we're thinking about how we can quantitatively measure the safety and security of AI decisions and how we can um, then uh, give these tools in the hands of experts that we trust, such as medical doctors, such as, um, I don't want to say policemen, but really medical doctors <laughs> and uh, people we trust to, to make final decisions. Okay. So we are actively working on these issues. Okay. There is no global answer that is really fit for all, no big principle, some things are worrying, some things are reassuring. Uh, there may be a time, there you, for instance, doctor, you may say, okay, I want my uh, diagnosis and treatment to be in the hands of a human, of the doctor. 
For instance, you may want this because you think it's principle that humans care for humans, or you may want this to make sure that the human keeps the sense of responsibility, like, you know, I'm in charge, I'm motivated, if I do it wrong, I may have a blame or I may be, be uh, laid by the order of medical doctors, etc. And uh, also because there is a human side, you know, when it's diagnosis, it's how you announce it, what kind of strategy we'll do, etc. But there may also come a time in which you may sue your medical doctor because he did not use the accurate tool that helped his decision, uh, etc. You may think, as a training for this, you may think what happens when your taxi driver, there's a failure in his electronic system so that his waste system will not work and he's unable to take you to the uh, decision. Who, who do you blame? How do you react to this? As a, let's say, as a thought experiment about how the responsibility of the uh, has to be shared. <laughs>